real pleasure to be here this evening. But I did not expect to be here sharing with you what I'm about to until I was much older. In the tropical sea between Northern Australia and Papua New Guinea there lies a tiny coral island called Bramble Cay. This is the home, the only home, of the Bramble Cay melamus. The species has been living there for thousands of years. The populations have been well monitored and stable. But in late 2014, warm sea temperatures and rising sea levels created an enormous storm which sent waves over the top of the island. Since then, there have been many searches for the melamus, but not a single one has been found, and there are none in captivity. The Bramble K. melamus has become the first mammal to be declared extinct due to climate change. This is a picture of my colleague and friend, Kit Kovacs, and she has spent the last 25 northern summers out on the Arctic Ocean monitoring marine life. She's a specialist on this little species, the ringed seal. Ringed seals live their entire lives on sea ice. Then almost never found on land. They birth their pups on sea ice um, and they build little caves in the snow to protect them from their main predator, which is polar bears. But in the last 10 years or so, Arctic sea ice has declined drastically and there's been very little snow. This has meant that the seals had to pup without proper protection for their young. Kit and her team have observed over the last years that they're years when almost no babies survive. They're all taken by the polar bears. This is obviously very concerning for the ring seals, but also in the long term for the polar bears. I'm sure that you've all heard the tales of coral reef bleaching, which now has become a regular phenomenon in tropical waters around the world. Coral bleaching, it sounds very chemical, very industrial. But in fact, corals are animals. And what happens in each bleaching event is a drama that is worthy of a Hollywood movie. Let me introduce the characters to you. Firstly, there's coral, pale and tentacled. She provides the structure, she's the homemaker. Then, there's flamboyant, colorful algae. This is a yellow one, but of course there are pink, fluorescent green, blue, fantastic colors. And these two have had a partnership that had lasted millions of years, and that's created coral reefs that have become recognized as wonders of the world. But in the past decades, sea temperatures have begun warming, and then things changed. In fact, the algae, take great advantage from the warmer waters and they begin photosynthesizing faster and faster. And this produces such an excess of oxygen that it becomes toxic for the coral. They can't live with or without them. The coral kick out the algae, so turning white, and starve. When they die, the reefs crumble and disintegrate. Coral reefs cover only 1% of the ocean, but they are home to 25% of marine life. They also support the livelihoods of over a billion people. So what's driving these changes have, that have begun to emerge over the last 10 years? The clue lies in the breath that you are about to take. Carbon dioxide is one of the most important greenhouse gases, and it works to insulate the planet, causing warming. So let's take a look at what carbon dioxide levels have been doing. This graph shows in white the trends in carbon dioxide levels over the last 800,000 years. And as you can see, they fluctuate relatively regularly, but never go much above 300 parts per million. In red is temperature, and you can see how it tracks the carbon dioxide levels. When the gas levels are high, then the temperatures are high. Now let's zoom towards the present, the right. 
And you see that around about 1800s, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, that cycle changes and carbon dioxide levels increase rapidly. This was the time that we started to take fossil fuels like coal and oil out of the ground, burn them, and then they landed up in the atmosphere. This year, carbon dioxide levels are nearly 50% higher than when the Industrial Revolution began. You're breathing in more than, or nearly 50% more CO2 than your ancestors did. So what do you think this does to the temperatures? Well, this graph shows the trends of 2017's temperature relative to the past. Blue areas are where it's cooled, red areas are where it's warmer than usual. Overall, the planet is warmed by about one degree. Predictions are that we'll reach three degrees, at least by the end of the century. So what does carbon dioxide do? Well, of course, through warming, it leads to melting ice, which leads to rising sea levels, but it also leads to an increase in extreme weather events. So we can expect an increased frequency and intensity of storms, droughts, heat waves, and floods. Carbon dioxide also dissolves in seawater to create carbonic acid. And this acid effect is really detrimental for many sea creatures. Last year, a few of us biologists from around the world pooled our knowledge of impacts that we had seen in our different systems and different regions. We looked at impacts of climate change on genes, species, ecosystems, to see just how extensive they were. And we found that in fact 82% of biological processes have already been impacted by climate change. So many people say to me, Jesus, this is very depressing. How do you stay working on this? Don't you get depressed? How do you keep passionate? How do you keep going? So I thought I'd share a little of my journey. Perhaps give some insight into your own relationship with climate change. I began working in climate change and biodiversity 15 years ago. My focus has been on predicting climate change impacts on biodiversity. And uh, I am very interested too in what we do about minimizing the impacts. And I find it fascinating work, truly, to understand how these systems work and how species and ecosystems function. It's particularly interesting too when you change variables like temperature and ocean chemistry and you get to see if you really did understand how it worked. I've got to work with fantastic scientists from around the world and on species ranging from lemurs to corals to mammals. It's really very interesting work that I've very much enjoyed. But something really shifted the day I got the message about the Bramble K extinction. I'd been making predictions all these years, but somehow it was always in the future. It wasn't supposed to happen yet. And when I finally had to experience it, it shifted me right from my head and became personal. And it's true, it is depressing and I became quite disillusioned. I wasn't sure that I really wanted to carry on this work. I mean, what role could I play it wasn't my fault anyway. Uh, I just let somebody else deal with the problem. I wanted to just get on with my own life. And luckily, I was in a position where I could really change some things. So I quit my job, packed up my life, closed my computer and all the numbers, and I went to the Himalayas. And there I walked, <laughs> and I talked to farmers and to nomads and spent time in nature reconnecting. There I found a system that was already being quite heavily impacted by climate change, melting glaciers, and extreme weather events, and people who were just getting on with dealing with the problem. And I found when I rested and reconnected that in fact, 
the place that I was feeling distress about the Bramble K extinction was the same place that gave me passion for the work. And when I brought the two together, that was the place of empowerment. When I reconnected with nature and with my community, then I could find my role. I could also recognize the role that others were playing and deeply appreciate that. So now, what do we do about climate change? How do we take that energy and move forward? Well, first of all, we need to stop making the problem worse. <laughs> Luckily, when we team up with nature, we have fantastic allies. Oceans and forests already take up more than half of the carbon dioxide that we emit every year. On top of that, people have been making fantastic strides in reducing use of fossil fuels. Also switching to renewables, they're fantastic technologies and people are taking them up. I've been deeply impressed with the kind of innovation and original thinking that's happening around reducing the carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas problem. But of course, we also need to adapt to the changes that we're locked into. Again, nature really helps us out here. Mangroves and coral reefs help to buffer us against storm surges, sea level rise. Our forests and our wetlands are sponges for water. And of course, many people are also helping to plan better infrastructure, roads, and, um, and cities. Also, farmers choosing better crops. And in our drought here in Cape Town, I think we've seen one of the most fantastic examples of how people can really shift behavior and adapt. I think it's very important, too, to remember these guys, these species that have been our early warming against uh, climate change. They're also really important in helping to us to understand the mechanisms of impact, some of them really unusual and unexpected. Have you yourself considered your own vulnerability to climate change, that of your family and your community? They also remind us how important it is to look after nature, to help nature, these species, to adapt to climate change, protecting our wild space and species, and try to minimize the other stresses and threats that they deal with. We've come a long way, but we have a long way to go and many more people to bring on board. However it's been done before, here we sit not far from Robben Island where this man took part in such a great challenge, a great change in the past. Of course he didn't do it alone, and it took a long time, 40 years, great million, million people at least who contributed in different ways gave their Time gave their lives, sometimes just gave a few pennies. I bet when he sat in his cell there, all of those years, that he could not know whether the effects of his life work were going to be futile or have an effect at all. But he continued with his personal journey and it was only in the big picture, in the long term, that his role became apparent. So now it's our turn. This is our great time of change and our challenge. This is a truly global one, and we stand here at a pivotal time. But what each of us needs to do is just to take a step. Wherever you are, take that step. You might be an oil baron, or you might already be an activist. You might be a professional person, a parent, a teacher, a student. All of these are fantastic places to start. What you do is important. It contributes to a much bigger whole. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to do everything. Just take that step. And remember that you are part of one of the most spectacular human nature teams that exists. So if you ever tired, disillusioned, or distressed, go into nature. Go into nature, go and sit beside the ocean, get into the ocean, go climb up a mountain, go sit under a tree, or even just put on a nature documentary. Go and reconnect and feel your team cheering you on. Thank you.